Standing up here today is not because I'm good, but by the grace of God. Last year it was smaller than this. This year is bigger. And I'm promising you it's going to get bigger. I've seen faces here who put a smile on my face. I must tell everybody here that you know, you're all special to me. You're not here by chance, but by a special reason. You've all touched my life and you've been good. They are my patients, they are my friends, they are my colleagues, they are my high school classmates. I have a friend here who flew all the way from California. He said he's heard about this thing and he's going to call me and talk about him. Dr. Obrique is a, a high um, risk OB in California, Los Angeles. Please tell him to tell him to try. He came back to try. He said he's going to go back to the Los Angeles and tell them that. It's true that the Sandwiches don't have to party. So, we're going to take good things back there, okay? So, I just want to thank you very much for coming out. Just for the sake of uh, always having God first. There's a pastor here, I've been fighting for the last 10 years. He never came. So, but tonight he showed up with a beautiful wife. And I'm going to call him here to pray for us to open this. So that, you know, the flood of blessing from the gates of heaven will pour all of us in. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful for your abundant blessings. We thank you for using Dr. O in such a marvelous way. This has become a staple of Columbus. We thank you for his medical talent. We thank you that Columbus hosts some of the greatest medical minds in the nation. We thank you for blessing them to allow their knowledge to bless our community. We ask your blessings now upon each and every family as we come into the holiday season, realizing that there are different cultures here and different ways of expressing a joy during this season. We ask your blessings on each and every one of them. In Jesus' name I pray. Bless the food for the nursing of our minds and bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this evening I brought out uh, one of the greatest defectors in doctors I ever came out of there, Georgia. He was supposed to be here last year, for some reason he wasn't able to be here. And he promised me a year ago that he was going to be here. Jeff Stevens is a professor of infectious disease from Brazil, he asked him. We've been friends for a long time. And uh, he graciously, without getting a single dime from me, to come out here to come and talk about HIV and where we were before, where we are now, and where we are going to be in the future. It's going to be a great talk. The slide that is made, it took a lot of time to make it. I'm going to have them on my website. I'm sure you all know that I have an, uh, a website, Global Infection Disease that I would place it there so that whoever wants to see, can see. So, without wasting more time, I'll ask uh, Dr. Stevens to start this lecture. Disease hey, doctor, I grew up in Atlanta, and I went to med school here in Georgia, and I did my infectious disease training in Wake Forest. When I was in medical school in Macon in 1985, as a second or third year medical student, I saw my first HIV patient. That was 33 years ago. This is my fourth decade in taking care of people with HIV and B, and also my last decade as I've been retiring a few years. And Dr. Livawali asked me last year if I would sort of give my life uh, experience with HIV. 
And I recognized that I would have a mixed audience of physicians, non-physicians, interested parties. And so instead of doing a traditional lecture, I, I, I got pictures of different things. I'm sort of going to talk about uh, kind of where we've been. And I'll try to do a little science, but a little more talking. And I remember the first HIV positive patient I saw was a young man with Kaposi sarcoma on his face. He had these purple tumors. And I was really amazed by that. And of course, back then, we didn't have any medicines. And then after I graduated from medical school, I went to Emory uh, for residency in, in Atlanta in the late 80s. It was one of the absolute epicenters of HIV uh, in this country. And a third of our admissions were HIV related. So every medicine team, we had four medicine teams on at night. We would divide up the admissions, HIV, unit, and floor. And we actually called it high five, HIV, the room in five. We called it high five. How many high five admissions would you have at night? So I literally saw hundreds of people uh, with, with HIV uh, in my training. And that's one of the reasons why I went into infectious diseases. So I'm gonna talk about HIV from the past, where it came from, the evolution of it. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the present, kind of the therapy, and then I'm gonna talk about cure strategies at the end, and what does that mean, and a little bit about prevention. And again, for those of you, it's been a long time since you've talked about viruses. Viruses are not like, they're not really a living thing, they're a parasite. They infect cells of animals and plants and bacteria, and they use our machinery in our cells to make new copies of themselves. This is what HIV looks like. It binds to our cells with these little receptors out here, the GP120. And when you get HIV, it basically damages your immune system. I tell patients, you know, whenever you have a little pimple, you pop the pimple, you get the little white stuff out. Those are white cells, and they're kind of like Pac-Man to eat up germs. Well, HIV doesn't kill those white blood cells. It kills the boss white blood cells. Like in a marching band, the guy in front, the drum major, more keeps everybody playing together to uh, write and making music right. Well, HIV kills the leader of the band. And over a period of years, it beats you down. And then when you finally reach a certain point, which I'll show a slide on that, you get the complications that we know about this AIDS. If you look at different kinds of organisms, humans have lots of genes in our DNA. Our DNA makes up lots of genes. HIV is a small thing. It's only about 9,000 little pieces of DNA. And it's interesting is that we and our DNA and our cells is made up of old viruses, a lot of it that we carried along for millions of years. And we only knew this for a few years ago when we did the Human Genome Project. We actually knew that before. A lot of our old DNA that we don't kind of use as old viruses. So as evolution has gone along, we fought off these things for a long period of time. And sometimes, you know, we, we carry pieces of their DNA along with us. This is what the genes of the virus look like, and it's not important, except to say that the different parts of it, the gag pawn in, make proteins that we now have medicines against different parts of that. And since 1987, first drug was approved when I graduated from medical school, there have been almost 40 drugs approved for HIV. And it, it basically has changed the world. And I remember when I graduated from medical school and I was at Grady Hospital seeing patients, AZT was approved. It was the only medicine we had. And we put people with HIV on it and they had to take it around the clock. They had to take it every four hours. They had to get up at three o'clock in the morning and take the dose. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever and ever. Unfortunately, a few years later, we found out that that single drug didn't do very much. Matter of fact, it probably didn't help you very much at all. But the world changed in 1995 when we came up with what's called now heart therapy or, or combination therapy. We'll talk about that as we go along. This is, and you can't see this in the back too well, but this is how many millions of years, if you go back, the evolution of viruses uh, have come along. And if you look, you can't see it all down there. There are lots of uh, cousin viruses to HIV and our cousins, the chimpanzees and other apes. And that's how it was introduced into humans over the past hundred years. People say, well, why did it get going after World War II? HIV is probably introduced into humans at least three times in the past century, uh, probably starting in the 30s. Why didn't it going until the 60s and 70s and 80s? That's something you talk about over pizza and beer with people. But again, scientifically, you know, blowing air liars, the end of the colonial era, the pill, lots of things we don't know. But the first cases really were noted in the 60s and it got going in the 70s and then in the 80s. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and again, with the virus, um, 
this is the cell, one of your white blood cells that it infects. It binds to it, it kind of encodes its RNA, we're DNA. It uses its RNA to turn into DNA like us, goes inside of our nucleus, makes more copies of itself, comes out, folds up, buds off, and goes to another cell. We actually now have medications that affect every part of the life cycle. And using that combination of therapy has led to an amazing time in which HIV is now a chronic manageable illness. I tell, I was in an HIV clinic this morning and saw three new young people with HIV, never been on medicines. And I always tell a little statistic. In the United States, if you're 20 years old, walking down the street, totally healthy, and somebody comes up and puts a gun to your head. And this happens in this country since we're gun nuts around here, I guess. And you say, you got a choice. Start smoking or get HIV. And most people would choose smoking. But now you'll live longer with HIV. Take your medicine to smoke. It's pretty amazing how far we've come. And again, we'll talk about that as we go through the different parts of I wish you could see this, but this is the family tree of HIV. Since I'm old, I have to have my readers on here. <laughs> Pantroglobitis is a chimpanzee. And these are all the cousin viruses, simian viruses, SIV, CBZ, which is the direct progenitor of HIV-1. In West Africa, we have HIV-2, which is very similar to SIV, the semi-immunodeficiency virus. HIV-2 is an interesting illness in that it's dying off because it's not passed mother to child and it has a more benign course. It takes about 25 years to get sick from HIV-2. We just don't see it in this country. And for a long time, our testing would not think of HIV-2 unless somebody had, had, had uh, sex with somebody from Africa or was from Africa, West Africa, Gabon, Odebloch, Sierra Leone, something like that. You wouldn't even think about it, but our testing actually finds find that now. What is interesting is that some of our HIV medicines we use here do not work on HIV-2. So it is an important thing if you know that. In my career, I've only seen a couple of people with it, and it will be gone in not too much longer. But that's a little family tree there. That's more of it in, in uh, the family tree, and the reason I'm putting that in there is that I think a lot of people, especially lay people, don't understand the diversity of HIV. Whenever you're infected with HIV and you're not on treatment, you make 10 billion new viruses every day. And your body makes about a, a billion of the, the white cells, the CD4 cells that the virus kills. And actually, to this day, we still are not exactly clear. You know, viruses kill cells in different kinds of ways. The actual pathophysiology of how HIV uh, causes the deletion is not actually clear, and it may be different in different parts of the body. When you first get infected early on, usually through, through sex, it spreads throughout your body and it wipes out the immune system in your gut in the first few weeks. And then that part of your immune system never comes back. So you're, you're never quite the same. Even now we have medications that whenever you get on the meds, the virus goes to sleep, your immune system recovers in the blood. You're not quite the person you were. And that's why that with the gut immune system gone, you end up having lots of the, the 100 trillion germs in your gut. More of them get out into your blood, your body is inflamed, and the diseases of aging occur earlier in people with HIV, even if their virus is quiet. So it's hard for our patients sometimes, because whenever I tell them their virus is great, everything is thumbs up, they tune out about their high blood pressure, too many honey buns they eat. That's been the big thing in the last month in clinic. Everybody likes honey buns. Uh, wow, and the nurses have put that as my screensaver because I'm on this thing about honey buns. I have some people that are eating four honey buns a day. I don't know if the, the, there's a honey bun epidemic, but I think there's something going on in, in Macon, Georgia about sweets. As I tell people, I don't eat sweets because I'm sweet enough as it is. But the, our patients uh, really, that is a problem because there's, uh, you know, everybody's focused about HIV and the stigma and all that, and HIV is actually pretty easy to treat if you take your meds. And I should go ahead and mention that for those of you that are not, you know, know much about medication adherence and all this stuff. And I, and I will talk about that later. But if you take your blood pressure medicines, probably 80% of the time, you're good. With HIV meds, you need to take it 90 or 95% of the time correctly. And 95%, let me give you an idea of taking meds 95% of the time. In a 30-day month, 95% is 28 and a half doses. You can't miss half a dose. It means missing one or two doses of, 
a month. And that's a hard burden for anybody to do your entire life for 40 or 50 or 60 years. And it's led to now the development, we're gonna very soon have injectable drugs that have long lasting, get a shot in your hiney once a month uh, and do that. And that's going to be interesting too because it's still hard for a lot of people to take medicines. Every next one's the other one, the Trim 5 Alpha. These are the big three groups. Uh, the one that we see the most of is, is the group M. And then the clay is clay B. B is the one in the United States and, and, and in Europe. And what's interesting about these families, and as I said earlier, every day if somebody's not treated, you make 10 billion new viruses. And every time the virus replicates, makes a new copy of itself, it mutates one or two times. So 20 billion mutations are made every day. So every mutation against every drug we would ever make is made every day in somebody not on treatment. That's why combination therapy is important because if by chance one of those mutations is resistant to one of the medicines you're, you're on, we, we try to hit it with the others. And that's why we do resistance testing on everybody at baseline because people can transmit certain mutations. Even though we see less of that, it certainly can happen. And that's why a single drug will likely never be strong enough or be able to cover HIV because of its diversity when it replicates. And this is also a problem with vaccines. And people say, oh, I wish we had a vaccine for HIV. Well, guess what would happen if we all had an HIV vaccine? Is what would happen to your HIV test? It would be positive. So your insurance company would be a little worried about that. And also, if you actually had a breakthrough infection, that would be harder to find out and you would actually have to look for the virus itself. And that gets to be complicated. So people talk about, you know, vaccine being a holy grail and all that sort of thing. That's all well and good, but there's no free lunch, you know. Again, you learn that when you're, when you're a kid. And so vaccine is difficult because we still don't know what are called the immune correlates of protection. We don't know what it would take to make protection in all the different parts in your blood uh, the linings of your mucosa, your vagina, rectum, mouth, everything like that. We don't know what that would take, even though progress is made uh, all the time. Again, uh, vaccine is probably a hard road, uh, hard, it's a very hard uh, road, and it might be different for these different clades. And so the concern would be is that if you had a vaccine that would work in clade B, like in the Americas, well, that, that would not be enough for the Asian clades. And so that gets to be very difficult. So vaccine is not something that I, I've told people is probably not something that is behind the list of possibility. And these are the clades around the world. I said clade B is in North America, also Australia, Western Europe. Again, in Africa, where this came out of, as you can see, it has the most diversity, both the M, N, and O. O is also called outlier clade, O. But you can see the diversity around the world. And, and as I said, that might complicate uh, things like vaccines and others because it is different in different places. And in the early 1980s in New York, in San Francisco, and Los Angeles, a lot of doctors noted a funny thing. A lot of young, uh, mainly gay uh, males, would come in with pneumocystis pneumonia, which is an unusual pneumonia usually only seen past before that in people with different kinds of immunosuppression, cancers, it had been described in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, but uh, Mike Gottlieb uh, noted this and he wrote it up in the MMWR and this was when I was in college and this is now, you know, almost 40 years ago. And what's interesting is, is that he wanted to study this and the folks at UCLA did not want to do this because they thought it would be politically unpopular. He ended up leaving UCLA. And I've met him, and in the 19, I've met him several times. We actually had a very nice dinner at a meeting in Orange County about 20 years ago. But I remember in the 1990s, he was very popular, and he was always taking Elizabeth Taylor to all these American Foundation for AIDS research uh, meetings. He always was on the arm of Elizabeth Taylor. I always thought that was kind of funny. So he got to be quite the media person. He's actually a good guy. And he's still in practice, but he was an immunologist. And he made the first uh, uh, report, and then soon after, it was amazing. It really became something, uh, it was an epidemic. And in the 1980s, in this country, of course, the demographics were, you know, gay and bisexual men for uh, injecting drug users. But worldwide, the most common way that people get um, HIV is through heterosexual intercourse. 
And I remember saying that in the 1990s at Fort Valley State, and my woman got up and said, I don't believe that, and walked out of the room. And I thought, I'm just the messenger. You know, don't, you know, don't, shoot, them, don't shoot the messenger. Women is that their viral loads are a little lower on average than men, but the natural history is about the same. And people's viral load can be in the millions, and it can be very low. I, I, I use the thermostat in your house. Some people have a hot thermostat a certain way up, some way down. And the amount of virus in your blood is based on two things. What your immune system you got from your mom and dad and what kind of virus you got from wherever you got the virus from. And that set point, once you get infected, you get this, and I have a picture of that in a second here. You get this big bump for first, and then it comes back down to what's called your set point. And if your set point is high, you tend to progress faster. If your set point is low, you tend to go slower. And there are people who have undetectable virus by themselves. And that's because their immune system controls the virus. We call those, they keep changing the name. We used to call them long-term non-progressors. Now we call them elite controllers. And some of them have undetectable virus without any medications. And that's about one in 200 people with HIV. But that's what we basically do with medications. We make the virus go to sleep. We don't make it get in all the hidey holes in the body. And we'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about viral reservoirs. So you get infected, come down to the set point, your immune system comes down, but the testing, we can find out if you have HIV now within a week or 10 days of your infection. So it takes pretty, it's pretty quick. Now, it is possible if you just got HIV yesterday, you'd actually have to look for the virus itself, and that would be kind of hard to do. But when you get the initial viral infection, your viral load can be in the millions, tens of millions, and it comes back down as your immune system kind of gets it under control. And as I said, the lower you are, the slower you go. And in the olden days, before we had the good medicines, before we knew, we would let people's immune system drop. In most of the world, the world health organizations will let you drop almost to the level of AIDS before starting medicines. But now, anybody who has detectable virus, we offer them medications because the, the benefit so far, far outweighs the risk that it's amazing. And as I said, if you take your medicines, your expectation of longevity should be pretty much, if you had a twin, uh, same medical problems, HIV, you know, an identical twin, and you were positive your twin was not, I mean, you're, if his life, his or her life expectancy was 78.6, yours might be 77.9. I mean, it might be six months on average, but in a lifetime, it pretty much, any difference. Can't see that. Now, I want to point this out. I got to get closer again. I feel like, I feel like I'm in a night up here. So, this is the incidence in people aged 15 to 49 from last year around the world. And this is the prevalence. As you can see in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 4.1%. In the Americas, it's about 0.5%, which means in the global, and it's different in different parts of the world, the global prevalence is about 0.8%, which means about one out of every adult, 100 adults in the world is HIV positive. And people are surprised by that. Well, hepatitis C, it's 1.8% of the world is HIV positive. It's very common. And, um, you know, uh, you could break it down. Uh, and I'll, the next slide is here. Is this, is, this is in, in 2017. 37 million people are living with HIV. And it's about 18 million women and about 17 million men. So it's about one to one. Children, it's about 1.8 million. In the United States, there's probably less than 50 kids born with HIV in this country a year because if the mom takes HIV medications and the virus is less than a thousand copies, the chance of the kid getting it is less than 1%. You can't do studies on HIV in children in the United States because we just don't have any. As long as the mom gets prenatal care and gets HIV testing. And even in the 90s in Macon, we actually had OBGYNs that wouldn't test their patients, which is shocking to me. And I, I, it, was, it would drive me nuts. And we still have people that come in and never have prenatal care. <laughs> you have to do some moving and grooving at the time of, of delivery. But uh, even in the old days, whenever you weren't on treatment, it was about 30% transmission to a child 
And even using the AZT drug by itself, it went down to about 9%. And as I said, with the drugs we have now, it's less than 1%. My colleague, Harold Catron, loves taking care of folks, pregnant folks with HIV, and we have this huge database. And we actually had two people in a row last year with quiet virus who broke through. Because statistically, it's still one in 100, it's not zero. But, it, but in the developed world, there's no reason to have HIV transmission pretty much from mother to child. The United States, I pulled this up. Uh, guess which state has the highest number? Georgia. See that dark there? Like that? Yeah, Georgia's always been top 10 for HIV. Atlanta's always been top 10. That's the rate per 10,000. Georgia's the highest. Uh, and actually, uh, in places like San Francisco, where they have what's called test and treat, where you treat people immediately when you get in, them in the hospital or diagnosed, if people, and I, I, I'm, I'm stealing some thunder, thunder from the end of my talk, if you're undetectable, you can't pass the virus to other people. We call that undetectable equals untransmissible. You equal you. Doesn't mean you can't get other STIs. But if your virus is quiet, it really is pretty much zero. So in places that are good about that, I'm probably in, in Macon, in our clinic, we probably have new, more new HIV patients now than they do in the, in the Bay Area in San Francisco every year. That's why we have so many drug studies. My colleague here, uh, Audrey Brown, who was my resident, who runs the clinic here way back when, and folks in Georgia, we have lots of patients. We don't see that in other parts of the country. Obviously, uh, Folks, uh, folks of color are, are, uh, have a higher risk, and again, it's only 12% of the U.S. population are African American, but they account for 40% of the folks with HIV. The other thing that's surprising to folks that I have to say uh, these days is that by 2020, 70% of people with HIV in the United States will be more than 50 years of age. It's a, ger it's a geriatric disease. I'm geriatric now. The patients are geriatric. The, the disease of aging occur earlier. And a lot of people who do what I do in the early days, because we were always playing around with these very resistant viruses and trying to be really cute about switching the medicines around, they're getting out because they don't want to do primary care in folks with their diabetes and their smoking. And we want to take care of cool viruses and cool meds. Dr. Lubawali's still a warrior. He still does all that. But a lot of people who do what I do around the country, you know, more well-known than I, are getting out of the game of the last year. They're going into industry, or they're doing other things. And there's been a lot of editorials and gnashing of teeth that some of the some of the really bright stars in HIV care are getting out of the game. Trying to get an HIV reactivation, trying to kill you know stem cells. I said that again. That's become less exciting after the last two or three they've done. They eventually still got infected, reinfected. So this is where we are right now, and I'm going to end up in a minute or two. This is called 90-90-90. The World Health Organization wants by 2020 for 90% of the people in the world who are HIV positive to know their status, 90% of those folks on medicines, and 90% of those on medicines with undetectable virus. In the United States, we are so far from that that you don't even want to know. I don't know how you get people, you know, I, I tell folks all the time, I can lead a horse to water, I can't make them drink. I don't know how you get, I mean, stigma, Poor access to care. We don't have universal health coverage in this country. It's it's a strange business. There are some places, by the way, somebody asked me, is there a place in the world that already is 90-90-90? The answer is yes, Sweden. They have 8,500 people. They're all on meds. They're all quiet. Some cities are 90-90-90. Vancouver, one of the early pioneers of, of HIV care at the British Columbia Center for Excellence there at the hospital. And the HIV meeting in 1996 I attended in Vancouver was the one where these medicines came out. We, we were dancing. We could not believe that, you, that, that all this happened in a single year. This all happened in a single year between 95 and 96, all these new drugs. It all changed in a single year. And I remember I was there and I was like, this is amazing. We thought maybe we kept it quiet for a while. You'd stop. Well, now we know about this reservoir business, and that makes it a lot tougher. I mentioned you equal you. Undetectable equal untransmissible. If your virus is quiet, you can't give it to your partner. That's why we call it treatment as prevention. Treating people with HIV is important because it decreases the chance of passing it on. And 
And in communities, we look at what's called the community viral load, places like Vancouver, San Francisco. If you get a, the, the average virus in the community below a certain level, you're going to have very few or no transmissions. So treatment is important as prevention also. The other thing that we now have is called PrEP. That's for people who are HIV negative who don't want to get HIV. We give them part of the cocktail, as they call it, and it decreases the chance significantly of them getting it. It works amazingly. It doesn't keep them from getting other STIs. That's the problem. But the U equal U is a big deal. So HIV is now a chronic manageable illness. How it actually kills the white blood cells is still kind of complicated. Again, I've already bored you enough with some of the science here. The drugs are good to great. Access and adherence still remain an issue. The functional cure may be possible. I don't think a viral cure will ever be possible. And worldwide, the epidemic is beginning to wane. And in places like Botswana and in South Africa, uh, things are, access to care is good, uh, getting better, people are taking. I was in Tanzania, I did Kilimanjaro a couple, three months ago. Uh, again, access to care is decent there. A lot of places are getting good but we could always do better. But I would suspect in 20 or 30 years, as the, our older patients, we get old, get out of the game, there's still be plenty of young people, but I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that over the long term, uh, HIV, it looks like it's, we're only going the right direction. However, HIV isn't sexy anymore. We don't see people wearing the red ribbons on, the, on TV. We don't hear people talking about it. That silly idiot Charlie Sheen's the last public person there to talk about his HIV, and boy, he's he's trouble. But uh, you really, people just don't think about it. But HIV is really amazing to have lived in my career to a point where it's much worse to smoke than to have HIV. Thank you. We need to thank uh, Jeff for a very good, uh, precise uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Jeff, what I did tell you was that uh, I assembled the best brain in Columbus, Georgia. At least to ask you a few words for your lecture. So I hope you're prepared. Sure. Good. Who's going to lead the park here? If nobody leads, I'm going to call someone. So if you. No, you have a question? Good. We well, have a young doctor here. She just got accepted to medical school. Please clap for her. Thank you, Dr. Allen. You spoke about stigma in your presentation. I would like to know um, how stigma has changed over the course of your career, or has it? Well, they used to say the old Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. And I think we live in interesting times in, that, in a country that is now so polarized and that uh, racism and things that I thought would, would be on the wane, maybe or not. And the same thing about stigma, I think it really varies. I still have patients who can't tell their family because they would be thrown out and would have no place to live. And I have that discussion every day. I think everybody who has a chronic illness needs somebody to talk to about it, whether it's a family member, a friend, a pastor, a counselor. And I have people who don't want to do that. In mental health, in my area, it's terrible. And uh, it's a real problem. So stigma can, uh, you know, again, HIV is just a virus. That's all it is. It's a virus. I don't understand why anybody would think much more than that, but people do, and it really varies. I think that overall it's probably less than it was, but we still have people who, you know, and I think one of the great evils of the world is social media. Um, we have lots of patients who don't want to tell somebody because they'll put it on that, whatever that face thing is, Facebook, what is that? But they'll put that in there, and they, you know, and again, you're not supposed to lose your job or whatever, but you still can have that happen, and it's a real problem. So I don't know how you cure that. Uh, you know, again, um, you can't 
cure, you can't legislate against ignorance, you can't uh, legislate against hatred and fear, and use it as people who are afraid of themselves, and they're just trying to do, but, so I don't know, but I do think that everybody, I, I truly believe in life that shared pain is lessened and shared joy is increased. And so, uh, if you're hurting or having trouble in a chronic illness, I think being able to talk to somebody is the utmost importance. And I can't tell you how many patients who I see every week have not told another soul. They live by themselves, and they have nobody to talk to about this. I, I, I find that very, they talk to me, but you know, again, and I mean, I, it, so the answer is it's all over the place, yes and no. Um, and so, but I do think that it's important for somebody to have support. And the online thing, there are online communities, and I think I, I've sometimes told people to reach out to that, to do that. That may be helpful to people, but, uh, but yeah, stigma is alive and well. Though I, I, if if it was a seven or eight out of ten in the eighties and nineties, maybe it's a six point five. Thank you for a great lecture. Um, my practice was in the UK, and there, the best opportunity we have for um, named screening for HIV infection is in pregnancy. Yes. Um, my question is straightforward, really. How relevant is the new capsule inhibitor that you spoke about to pregnancy? Uh, probably not very, because it would be hard to do studies in folks who are pregnant. You know, the ACT data by itself, the famous 079 ACG, T A C T G O seven nine trial from 1994 showed that AZT alone decreased it from 30 percent to 9 percent. So for two decades, OBGYN said you had to use AZT in the cocktail. We now know it's just the virus to be quiet. So I think an injectable drug is probably not useful, but it might be useful in post exposure prophylaxis. It might be useful in the very resistant, but it's just a new thing. I try to get you an idea of where we're going. I think we're into the era now where we have injectables, biologics, and some of these other targets. The drugs we have are fine. Even 10 years ago, a lot of people argued we didn't need new HIV drugs, we just needed people to be able to take them better and figure out how to do that. And that's hard because human nature, you can't fight human nature. It's like you can't fight City Hall. I wish it were that easy. People have tried everything. We have folks that set up their phone. We have folks that call. They did beepers back in the 90s. And Carlos Del Rio at Emory, they, and I always said for years, why don't we pay people to take the meds for a couple of years? Give them a bonus. Because they get them out of the hole, get their gas tank filled up, they'll live a lot longer, stay out of the hospital, save society bazillions. Well, they tried that. They paid people to come to drug treatment, come to clinic, follow up, didn't do a damn thing. So I used to say that was that if I had a big trial, and they did that trial, that work. It just is hard to get people humans. It's like herding cats. You know, humans are tough. And for everyone in this room who didn't take their blood pressure medicine this night, think about that when you look in the mirror tonight. <laughs> okay. Think about that. Or my cholesterol going. The only medicine I take is my statin. Am I good about it? No. I run 20 miles a week and my heart rate's 49, but I should be on a statin. I'm not good about that. My kids will probably fuss me on the way home for, for saying that, but that's okay. I deserve it. Okay. I'm not perfect, I'm a human being. But it's tough whenever you're trying to get people to take meds. I've now gotten because of the idea that when they take meds, you remind them that they actually have a problem. I'm telling people to lie to themselves. Tell them it's a vitamin, it's for your hair, for your skin. This is my new, this is my new, this is my new thing, is that tell, you tell yourself, you know, we all think we're younger and nicer and better looking than we really are. We all tell ourselves these stories. Tell yourself that little pill is for, for your hair, keep your hair pretty. Something. I, and this is my new tack. I've been trying this last couple of weeks. I don't know if it's working or not, but I'm trying. How does the healthcare delivery system impact on reaching the goal of triple 90, the 9090 system? And in other words, I'm asking, how does a universal healthcare versus what we have here impact upon reaching that threshold? Well, the, the problem is, is that in the United States, it's so disparate. I mean, we have AIDS drug assistance, which is the payer of last resort. And if you have nothing, we can get you your meds. But you have to jump through a bunch of hoops, do paperwork every six months, and you 
get your meds and it'll pay for some other things, but it doesn't pay, and we buy some blood pressure meds and things like that, but if you have uh, GI bleeding, and so it's not related to HIV, I can't send anybody anything. And in parts of the country where they're doing what's called rapid start, going to the hospital and starting people that day, that's fine, but you gotta get them into a clinic, get them signed up, I have a patient, and one of the patients I saw today, their ADAP is still pending. So I couldn't give him his meds. Because the one thing you don't want to do with HIV meds is stop and start them. Because if you stop and start and the virus wakes up, and there's a still a little bit of the old drug left, it can mutate and get resistant. Then you can't go back, and then you using the using up the bullets in your holster. So you either need to be on medicines perfectly, or off medicines, but not in between. And that's why, because we don't have and people lose their Medicaid, people lose their job, lose their insurance, they can't afford to cope. I mean, all these things happen. I take care of folks who don't have good access to care. But even if there's a universal access to care and everybody got a ticket, I still think a lot of people wouldn't take their meds. So I don't know what you do with that. It's a real problem. It's human nature. And how do you fight that? I don't know. When I was the angry young man who wanted to change the world, I thought I could do that. And I realized that the world doesn't want to change. We, like, we don't like change. We like things the way they are. Okay? But the only constant life is change. So you have to find a way to reach the button in that person to take meds. But the problem generally is not once people are in the system getting the drugs. It's more often them taking the drugs, to be honest with you. But again, if it was easier to do that, trend, the biggest problem we have is a new patient without health insurance in the hospital with a complication and getting them transitioned into a clinic and on medicine. That's, that's the biggest challenge I have to get them into care and keep them in care. Uh, by the way, and this is interesting, this is something new, because I used to would have said in the past, you know, the old say is you vote with your feet. You can say I'm gonna vote or do whatever, but you actually have to go do it. You have to vote with your feet, as the old saying goes. I used to think that if you were sick in the hospital with HIV, and I sent you back, I wanted to see if they would make it back to clinic and actually show up and suit up, fill out the paperwork and start their meds. It's actually been shown, and, I, and I'm a scientist, I'm a clinician, I'm data driven. Start people's medicine in the hospital, they have better outcomes in a year and they have more follow up. So, starting on the so called rapid start is probably what we should do. But again, if you have no ticket, how do I do it? Some of the drug companies are giving people a month of therapy and all that, and I try that, and then they still can't get meds at the end of the month. So, it's not really, it doesn't always work that way. You know, the, I live in the real world, not the perfect world. It makes it difficult sometimes. I'm trying to get back. So. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am a local hospice and palliative physician here in town. Um, I actually did my fellowship at Navicent Hill. Um, we, won't, we won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a very old and updated set of guidelines for um, hospice eligibility for HIV AIDS patients. Um, and of course, with all the new advances in um, HIV treatment, it's, I think, becoming harder and harder for us to determine really when someone is eligible for hospice who has HIV AIDS. Can you comment on what your perspective is in terms of hospice eligibility for patients with AIDS? I have two things. The, the death squad at NAPSEN has reported me to administration four times in the last 15 years. Um, because people don't understand that it is a chronic mental illness. I just had a lady that was in the ICU for a month with pneumocystis, and the, the team wanted to call a palliative, and I said, no, her brain's there, we have a chance, she's going home tomorrow. But it is outdated, it is hard, and I, and I just asked the palliative team at Navsen to please call one of us before doing that, because sometimes ho hospitalists and primary care teams, they just get tired of this patient, I hate to say it, and they just, they're HIV, and they got to go, it's, it really is it's, it, it crazy, but let me tell you something, I've said this a million times, this is really important. In the early 1990s in our clinic, we had coffee every morning for everybody. You had coffee cups, the little coffee cups, you knew who paid for the coffee cups. One of the local funeral homes in Macon. I've told that story many times. We, we lost about a person a week in the early 90s. We had probably 50 deaths a year from HIV. And we still have people coming with late disease that we can't salvage and them going to hospitals. But I, 
nobody wants, first of all, they don't want to go to hospice, but they don't want to take their meds. So they're in and out of the hospital these last six months of their life, and that's a bad scene. We still have a lot of those folks. They often don't, they're often demented, or they have substance abuse issues, or some combination of all that, and what they need is a nursing home. And a lot of times they get in a nursing home, they get their meds, their virus goes to sleep, their brain never comes back, and they live in a nursing home for 20 more years. I probably have 30 people like that. And that's a problem because of access to care. But yes, the palliative guidelines for HIV, it's difficult because a lot of people can be salvaged, but if their brain is bad, that's the problem. Because the, the brain can get better, but if you're truly demented or have you know organic brain syndrome from partying or blood pressure, whatever, a lot of times they don't get better. If they have MAC or lymphomas sometimes, CNS lymphomas, I probably had three or four deaths this year. But as I said, in the early 90s, we had 50 deaths a year. It's, it, and I can't tell you the last time I actually sent somebody to hospital. Well, I can't take, I take that back. We had a woman with COPD. She was 50, looked 100. Uh, she died of lung disease last year. Still smoking to the bitter end. Nice lady, no access to care. Son in prison in South Carolina, no place to live. On the streets of Salvation Army in Macon. But you can stay for 28 days, then you get kicked out. So what do you do? 28 days is 28 days. So that doesn't help you very much. It's a problem. It's, it's just, it's, it's reality, and unfortunately, you know, you can't, you, you, you do what you can, and you get frustrated, but it, it is the life that I live, and I try to help people with that, but I can't take it home, because it's not, you know, it, it, it's tough, but, but to have the tools that we have, it's, it's remarkable that what we have, it's remarkable, it's truly, if you had asked me, in 1989, at Embry Grady Hospital, all these sick folks, that 30 years later, we would have one pill a day to turn this. I would have, I would have, and as a fellow, a year later, I would have said, chances are one in a hundred. I would have been flat wrong. I would have, met, I would have lost that bet over and over again. Thank you very much. Well, this meeting is not going to be completed without asking. Dr. Dinitao, who talks all the time, who asks questions all the time. You have no ask questions. This is biology. I think that's why you're quiet. You have to ask a question. Dinitao. No question? Yeah. yeah. No, you have to. I told you. <laughs> I know originally, whenever we were looking at the injectables like at the IDSA, um, our first thought was, you know, this is a medication or a, you know, a, um, administration route it's going to help us with patients that are non-compliant. And then we realized, you know, it's going to, it's going to run out. It's got its half line. You have to, you know, have administration once a month. And so if you have a non-compliant patient, this is not the answer. So, so some people argue that. Some providers think it, you can sort of write her on people and do that. I, I tend to think it's for people whose occupations make it hard. I think it's for compliant people who are who need that. But some people still make the argument that you can take your problem children and and rein them in with this. I, I'm I'm I don't particularly believe that. I'm just wondering if um, since you're you know into the uh, research and looking at it a little bit more, um, is do you think the the administration is going to be you know? where they can actually make this available, like at a local CBS, or, you know, because patients do have a hard time with coming into a provider's office every single month. Do you foresee that the formulation, the administration, will every change where it can be administered? Well, you know, it's going to be expensive, and reimbursement's going to be an issue, and whether or not you get home health, or you come to a clinic, or to an infusion center, I think all that's still up in the air. Uh, I just think that most people are going to get tired of getting a shot in their butt every month for 20 years. I just think that's what people are just going to not show up. But for folks who are moving and grooving and, you know, on an airplane all the time, I have half a dozen people like that I think it'd be perfect for. But, I mean, having all these tools are helpful, but one size will never fit all. Some people, you know, we'll need other things at some point. And by the way, for you talking about post-exposure prophylaxis, a shot in the butt that lasts a month might be very good for that those trials too. That would be so you don't have to take pills for a month. That actually works. People would do that also. So there may be other uses. Look, I think we need to cut it off now, please. Please. Because I mean the night is going, Professor needs to come back 
And I'll be one or two things that I have to tell you know, everybody. Thank you very much. It was great. Wonderful. There's a couple of stories every year, in and out. We're able to bring somebody to talk to us. Stay on that bench. We're going to continue doing this, okay? We really thank you, Professor, for coming out. Um, there's a video that is showed up there. This was the video. If you came here last year, I was not able to show it. This was when I went to Nigeria. I told you that I took two speakers from America. Nadine Regis, I don't know whether she's here. She spoke to on the Bagnese. Infectious disease in Nigeria for me. And then um, there was Professor Golan from Top University that I took to Nigeria. Anyway, I couldn't go this year. I was going to make it a year later, but uh, I could not go this year. I intend to go next year, okay? And I'm going to be reaching out to volunteers, you know. I mean, in America, like I always tell everybody, I'm not rich. I don't have money. I don't. The only thing I have is my mouth. <laughs> and God has blessed me with this, okay? So, I'm looking to go to Africa, my country again, to take speakers to Nigeria. And this time, very interesting, a lot of you have expressed interest in going with us. I'm formulating a package for probably like a week visit to Nigeria, where we're going to have speakers that we're going to take from here. We're going to stay in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria. We're going to see how my country is that, you know, the image you have of Nigeria is not what you're going to see. If you're looking at that, you see, that's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. So, we're going to, we're going to go to Nigeria. I'll put, it up, I'll put it out. If you can, let me have your name, your email address, your cell phone number. I'll reach out to you. It's not going to be cheap because we're going to need donation, okay? So, I'm going to reach out to you. Don't see the text and see what people are there at the Okay? So, well, anyway, I really thank you very much you know, for coming out. The evening is just starting. There's a lot of food there. There's the Nigerian food that you always cook for, and the American food. I'm asking the Nigerians in the crowd, I'm asking you, please, sit down, let our guests. First of all, go and get their own food. There's no food, but I want them to have enough food, please. And I don't want the line to be too long on the Nigerian line. Let the, our guests, you know, go there and get them. You know. Nick is my son, my second son's friend. They were in um, kindergarten together, you know, middle school. Anyway, over the last um, six months, what's your adoption? And he's come to my office, he's my scribe. He does scribe it for me, along with some other. Uh, I have about three or four of them. I'm telling you, when it comes to your computer. What Nick saw my efforts, and Nick, very interesting, he came to my house on Thanksgiving Day, and he wrote a beautiful note. He says, Dr. O, since I've started with you, I've made 400 and something mistakes. And for those mistakes, he gave me 50 cents for each one of them <laughs> to contribute to this. If you look at the bottom there, Nick's name and his family name is there. Nick, I thank you very much. It was not a lot of money, but it meant a lot to me because you saw what I was doing and you thought you should have The good Lord bless you. Um, John Brown, are you here? Well, John Brown, after I've made all uh, the things for the people uh, out there, she gave me a big a fan check to Shinoke and I was going to recognize her. Each year, people that have given me uh, contribution are continue to do well. Some trusts continue to be the best bank in America, no matter how many police. Some trusts, I thank you very much. I have two great friends here. They always support me. Andre, where are you? And Emily. Coram. They're there. They're always the number one team in check. Thank you very much. God bless you for all you do. If I don't mention your name, that means I've not stepped up to the plate very well. You give me money for it's not enough. Next year, I give me more. <laughs> do you get that? So, I mean, there's only way, that's the only way I can do this. This is not cheap, this is expensive. And I want to recognize one person here. She's like a mother to me. Anywhere she is in the world, when she's sick, she's dying, she has a cold. Yay! They say, Dr. Nobody wants to have his party. He pops up. This is Dr. Fetcher's mom. This guy will be recognized. I thought that is my colleague. And I thought I said, oh, my mom has been sick 
for two weeks. But when I said, the third party wants to do it. He said, hey, okay, let's go. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish you all well. I'll be without the ticket for the drinks. It's uh, expensive. You can go and get the drinks. There's plenty of food there. Don't let the line be too long. The night is just beginning. I've told you, if you don't dance tonight, I'm not going to invite you to the next one. Okay. <laughs> so you have to dance. Okay? So, God is DJ. God is DJ. And in the world, we say it again tonight. It's going to be a time last year. So we dance, and we all enjoy that song. So get your food, and enjoy your song. We'll see you again next year. Listen to it. December 6, 2019. Write it down. We've got a match to get in here. It's going to be better than this. And we're going to bless God again for everything that's going to be next year. The match is going to be better Let's give a round of applause, please. All right, good evening. Family, friends, colleagues, children, enemies? No, not enemies. Um, <laughs> ah, Dr. Boale. No, seriously. It's been, you've been doing this for about 10 years. 11 years. 11 years. Wow. 11 years. Oh, that's not loud enough. Come on, we can do better than that. Now, there we go. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it takes a lot to put things like this together. And uh, your friends, colleagues, we appreciate coming every year, eating the good food for free. Um, um, I mean, pro bono. It is better that way, isn't it? Your friends have gotten together and we decided to present Dr. Anthony Boali with a small token of appreciation for the wonderful, wonderful men, the thought, the, um, um, the love that brings us together. Uh, more than words, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, so we're going to present this flag on behalf of Dr. Mesut Boale's friends for in appreciation of this dinner for the past 11 years as a small token. Thank you, sir.